Hope for the Culture. Now, here's your host, Dr. Walter Marco. Hello, and welcome to this edition of the Kingdom of the Cult. Our topic today is one which I believe you'll find very interesting, the cult of Christian science. In order to know more about the errors of this cult, as well as its doctrines, it's important to get some background on Christian Science founder Mary Baker Eddy, and we'll do that in a few minutes. We'll also be talking with Carolyn Poole, a lady who spent much of her life as a Christian scientist, and Douglas and Rita Swan, whose infant son Matthew died as a result of a treatable childhood disease because his parents followed the mistaken teachings of Christian science. I know you'll find all of this very interesting and informative. But first, in order to truly understand the background of Christian science, I believe that it's necessary to go back into history. Not recent history, but theological history, dating back 2,000 years to the time of Christ. Back in the first century, the church was attacked by two heresies that persisted in attracting followers from among naive believers. The followers of these two heresies were called the Judaizers and the Gnostics. The Gnostics believed that they had a superior and secret knowledge of Christianity and of God's will. They claimed that their knowledge was even superior to that of the apostles. They believed that God was not directly knowable. Angels of whom Christ was the greatest were emanations from the unknowable God. They infiltrated the early church at Ephesus and at Colossae, and it is notable that both John and Paul directed some of their writings against these Gnostic ideas. Obviously, they were causing trouble because they came in and proceeded to introduce all sorts of false doctrines maintaining that their religious knowledge was greater than all others. These early Gnostics taught that Jesus Christ of Nazareth was a projection from God. They said that he proceeded from God, but actually the physical world was evil. In fact, some of them called it an illusion. Their solution to conquer this so-called evil was to humiliate the flesh and exalt the mind of knowledge. John immediately recognized that this was an attack on the fact that in Christ, God became man. God had entered the material world in the person of Jesus Christ in order to identify himself with mankind. The Spirit of God always bears testimony to who Jesus Christ is. Who is he? John 1.1 and 1.14 tells us he is the one who came in human flesh, the Word made flesh, the reality of his incarnation. I say to you that Jesus Christ is true man and true God. If any of us deny this, then this becomes the manifestation of the spirit of the Antichrist. It's important then to remember that after about 500 years, Gnosticism virtually passed out of existence. For almost 13 centuries, Gnosticism was obscure and almost unknown until 1875, when a book entitled Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures was published by Mary Baker Eddy. In that book, Mrs. Eddy coined her scientific statement of being, and I quote, There is no life truth, intelligence, or substance in matter, but all is infinite mind and its infinite manifestation, for God is all and in all." Close quote. With one sweep of her pen, Mrs. Eddy breathed new life and popularity into the cult of Gnosticism. And thus Christian science was born. Most of these contemporary metaphysical cults, including unity, divine science, religious science, new thought, and others, sprang from the same doctrine that Mrs. Eddy put forth back in the 19th century, which is essentially Hinduism. They all say that God is not a personal being and that we all share part of God's nature. Another misguided doctrine that these mind science cults have in common is that they don't believe in the doctrine of the Holy Trinity or that it is in any way biblical. In fact, Mrs. Eddy took it one step further by stating that any Christian who believed the first commandment was a monotheist and thus should deny that Jesus was God. The unity cult holds the same view. Another connection that these cults have with each other is that they are all tied up in some way with the concept of divine healing as a metaphysical law. Matter is an illusion for most of them. Mrs. Eddy taught this, and it is a false idea in the mind. I find this statement ironic because despite this belief, Christian scientists seem to spend their time feeding and clothing an illusion. They all seem to die just like everyone else. In fact, the death rate is still one per person, and Christian scientists are still making it. None of these cults believe that Jesus Christ is the eternal God in human form. Mrs. Eddy called him, and I quote, principle. She defined the Trinity as life, truth, and love. None of these cults, including Christian science, believes in a personal God. Instead, they state that within each of us is the Christ idea. Jesus Christ is not God. He is a projection of God. 
They believed that Jesus possessed more of this Christ principle than we do, and therefore he was the supreme example of the Christ. It's important to understand here that they do not believe that Jesus was the Christ. Mrs. Eddy stated it this way, quote, The spiritual Christ was infallible. Jesus, as material manhood, was not Christ. Close quote. Personally, I don't think we could ask for a statement from Mrs. Eddy that was any more clear than that. As you may know, the Bible clearly refutes Mrs. Eddy on this point. In the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 16, the Apostle Peter refers to our Lord as, quote, the Christ, the Son of the living God, close quote. Verse 17 in this passage says, And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. I submit to you that this verse is proof that flesh and blood do exist, and that the material world exists too. This was God's opinion, not Peter's, not mine. It's also very clear that Mrs. Eddy and all of the Gnostics who preceded her were not great students of Scripture. If they had been, they wouldn't have made the mistake they did. Interpreting the Scripture is important. They made many, many mistakes. 1 John chapter 2, verse 22 and 23 says, Who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whosoever denies the Son, the same does not have the Father, but he that acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Close quote. Although Scripture completely refutes their beliefs, we should not take these Gnostic cults lightly. Unfortunately, many of them are growing rapidly today. The core of this spiritual deceit is the denial of the deity of Jesus Christ. When you talk to these people and confront them on that point, their typical answer is, well, this is a new way of looking at it, or... This is a new interpretation of it. I say to you that it's not true, and it's not new. It's just plain evil. It is a perversion of the truth of the gospel. All Gnostics agree on their basic terms. So they published a dictionary at the Unity School of Christianity in Missouri a few years ago called the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary, which lays out many of these terms. In that dictionary, they have redefined every conceivable term found in our Bible. For example... They define atonement as at one meant. All they did was hyphenate the word. They define Adam as a hyphen dam, an obstruction to thought. And resurrection is defined as spiritualization of thought. If you don't know what they are really saying when they use Christian terminology in their discussions with you, I guarantee you you'll be confused and won't know where they're coming from. Other cults are guilty of this too. I believe this is just another satanic lie to trick gullible people, if he can, into believing these cult structures that they are basically harmless and just another brand of Christianity. It's important that if you wish to witness to cultists like this, you define your terminology before you start talking about doctrines. Because if you don't, you certainly won't get anywhere. I'll be back later with some more comments about this cult for the cultured Christian science. But first, let's get some additional background information on the founder of this cult, Mary Baker Eddy. Our correspondent, Regina Seppel, reports from Boston, home of the Mother Church of Christian Science. Behind me are the headquarters of the Christian Science Church in Boston. The founder, Mary Baker Eddy, had the first building built in 1894. Twelve years later, the Mother Church extension was added. Today's church complex consists of 13 acres including a modern 25-story administration building, which was completed in 1972 at a cost of approximately $83 million. Mary Baker was born in 1821 and raised in a strict Congregationalist home in rural New Hampshire. As a young woman, she was frail and suffered much from what appear to have been nervous disorders and hysteria, according to church historian Kenneth Scott Latourette. Ill health reportedly led her to experiment with homeopathic remedies, hypnosis, and the mind cure techniques of a New England charismatic healer, Phineas Parkhurst Quimby. How much Mrs. Eddy's theology was influenced by Quimby is still being debated today. Quimby's followers, however, are created with starting the New Thought, Unity, and Positive Thinking movement. Mary Baker was married three times. In 1866, she sustained serious injuries after a fall and claimed that she was miraculously healed through discovering the divine laws of life. She 
She believed that the root of all sickness is fear and error. She regarded healing not as a cure for bodily ills, but as a spiritual regeneration, a setting aright of man's relationship with God. In 1875, she wrote Science and Health, which is today called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. It is described as a textbook, and passages are read at every Christian science service, along with passages from the Bible. In 1874, the first church was established in Boston with between 15 to 25 students. Within a decade, nearly 100 congregations had been formed. According to the Los Angeles Times, the appeal of Christian science was then, and is now, strong among urban, middle, and upper-class people who tend to be well-educated and affluent. Carolyn Poole calls Christian science a cult for the cultured. Well, Christian science, after many years of study, becomes so ingrained in a person, and I think I was typical of most of them, that it became my very life. And I wouldn't do a thing, I wouldn't think a thought or take a new step in life without either calling my practitioner to get her ideas and her prayers on it, or I would look to see what Mary Baker Eddy herself said. And she usually had a quote on almost every situation in life. So it really was I everything, not to mention the fact that I wouldn't dream of going to doctors, I wouldn't take medicine, I wouldn't even take a vitamin or an aspirin. That's how uh, deep I was in it. And of course, uh, I lived it. it. You know, you get isolated when you're in it because your friends are all Christian scientists. You read only Christian science literature. You're so busy doing all the things that you're supposed to do, getting your lesson every single day, that you don't have time for other things, and then fear sets in. You, you're afraid to get away from it. Mary Baker Eddy wrote a book called Science and Health. What is it, and is it more important to Christian scientists than the Bible? Christian science, scientists rely totally on what Mary Baker Eddy says for everything, and her textbook is this Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. And this was my own textbook that I had in the last years that I was in it. And you will see these little markers. We marked our lesson each week. And every day we study the same lesson as given in the quarterly. And this is the Bible. We study these together. And we look to this book for every answer to every problem, every thought. It took precedence over the Bible because it is supposed to interpret spiritually the Bible. And what it really does is changes the Bible. Because when you say the Bible, you just pick and choose uh, what they tell you to, to fit their doctrine. But of course, when you're in it, you don't know that. You feel that she is the authority, she's the revelator, and Christian science is the revelation. This is what you're told. And since they have healings, which do work, and it sounds so beautiful, you know, who wouldn't want a religion where there's no sin, sickness, disease, or death, and where you can control things through right thinking? It sounds beautiful, but what you don't know is that it's a complete denial of Jesus Christ. Who does the healing? Well, now we're getting into a touchy thing. We have to just name what it could be. It could be Satan, because we know that he's the angel of light who deceives people. There's always the possibility that God himself and his sovereign sovereignty will reach down to help someone to keep them from dying before they go to eternal damnation. But I do think there's a cutoff date on that, incidentally, or it could be psychological, psychosomatic, hallucination. But I do claim and believe with them that many of the healings are real. Could you tell us in a few sentences the basic beliefs of Christian science? Yes, I can. If you'll just remember that in Christian science, all is mind. God is mind, spirit, and man is made in his image and likeness, and the real man is spiritual and eternal, and this matter, and now matter is Mrs. Eddy's term to mean mortal mind, anything in this world that you can see or touch or feel or experience, is she calls matter, and it's the unreal and temporal. It's unreal, she bases it on the second chapter of Genesis as being the Adam dream. If you remember in the Bible that a mist came over the earth and Adam was put to sleep, well she calls this a dream existence. And as we grow spiritually minded through studying Christian science as given to us by Mary Baker Eddy, we come to know our real spiritual being as being the perfect idea of God. And we overcome all the false claims. But mixed in with it constantly, it's being drummed into the minds of people that God's spirit doesn't even know matter, can't be in matter, is greater than matter. And what does that do to Jesus? Jesus came in the flesh. And the Bible says that 
He was both God and man, God in man. And so it does away with Jesus, but you don't realize that. And then she sneaks into her writings, little statements that when you're a Christian scientist, since you don't already know the Bible to start with, you don't know what it is that you are taking in, such as saying that Jesus declared that he was not God. Jesus never declared that he's not God. She called Jesus the way sure. Jesus was not the way sure. He was the way. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no other way to God. So it's, it's just a complete corruption of the gospel. What is the main reason Christian scientists will not go to the doctor or take medicine? Raw, rank fear. Because it, you are taught over and over that everything is in the mind. And you're afraid if you go to the doctor and he says you have cancer and the nurse thinks that, then you will be so filled with fear and you will believe it or their belief will be on you that you uh, will have it. And you have to keep your thinking right all the time. Uh, otherwise, you are going to be subject to these false claims. And just to give you a, an example, I was out of Christian science four years before I could get the courage and the nerve to go to a doctor. I was saved. I knew who Jesus was, but I had to overcome what they constantly drill in you, fear of doctors and fear of, of nurses and, uh, and their thinking and medicine. How can Christian scientists read the Bible every day and still not believe the basic gospel of Jesus Christ's blood atonement for the sins of man? Christian scientists can read the Bible every day and still not see the truth because Mary Baker Eddy picks and chooses just what she wants out of the Bible. She sometimes leaves the name Jesus out when she quotes him, such as, believe, blank, 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 and thou shalt be saved. That's in the science and health. And the important thing in the Bible says, believe in Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so when you read your lesson every day, you're reading correlative passages that go with the science and health that back up Christian science. And she leaves out what it would be the gospel. So when you get through with her spiritual interpretation, in which she twists things, as an example, it is in the Bible that God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth, as the Bible says. But when you're in Christian science, what happens is you spiritualize everything you leave the flesh out. And she also changes uh, the meaning of words with her own definitions. For instance, here's a good one, atonement. When I was a Christian scientist, I could not have told you if you had offered me a million dollars what the word atonement meant, really meant. She said it means at one meant with God. I didn't know it had anything to do with the blood shed of Jesus Christ for our sins. Why are Christian scientists among the hardest people to reach with the truth? First place, because of fear. They're afraid of everybody's thinking. So they are taught to be secretive, to not let people know what they're doing or even where they are going. And so they hide themselves away from the mortal mind claims of this world. They read their own literature. They have their own nursing homes. They have their own reading rooms, which would be the equivalent, say, of a bookstore where they go to. They're so busy with their church work and each day getting their lessons, and they are also told that they are not to read unauthorized literature. Now, that's censorship, and that's dangerous. And where they are not being true to themselves is that they call themselves students. If you uh, ask a Christian scientist, sometimes they'll say to you, uh, if you ask them, what religion are you? They might say, I'm a student of Christian science. Now, a student is somebody who's supposed to study, and they call it a science. And anything that's a science could, should be able to be compared with other things. But no, they can't do that. They're afraid to read anything that's critical of Mary Baker Eddy. And we know for a fact that there are some excellent books that tell the true story of Mary Baker Eddy's life. One of them's written by uh, Edwin, let's see, Francis Edwin Bacon. And that book was kept off the shelves for years. It's a biography of a virginal mine, Mary Baker Eddy. There's another one by Neil Mine, which they highly criticized, written during her lifetime, highly researched, but instead they read the books about her life, which are authorized by their own writers, and they take the same stories of her life. They don't lie in the books about her, and I won't say that, but they take the story and they glorify her. No matter what she did, it was okay. They changed it around, and then some things they don't tell, like the fact that she took morphine, that's well documented.
for illnesses that she had. And they don't tell that. They don't emphasize or tell the fact that in her younger years, when she lived in these boarding homes, that she would go into seances. And Christian science, uh, that spiritualism, as you know, and Christian science forbids spiritualism. Christian science forbids hypnosis. But they don't tell you about the fact that she studied under Phineas P. Quimby, who got his start as a hypnotist. Now, these things, in the, anything that's a science and you're saying, they should be out in front. How did you find the truth and leave Christian science? And what do you think is the best way to reach others in it? Well, I think the best way is the way the Lord brought me out. However, it doesn't work that way for everyone. And that was because Christian science is supposed to be based on the Bible. We did study it every day. And she did say in her tenets that we take the inspired word of the Bible to be our sufficient guide for eternal life. And it is called One of the Pastors. I knew that it was the most important book that had ever been written, though I, however, I did cherish the science and health too. And I knew that I had never read it, that we only took pieces of it. So I had this hunger for years to try to read it and study it, and I found I couldn't. I couldn't understand anything that Paul said. Now I know why, because I was trying to fit his gospel in with Mary Baker Eddy's teachings, and they couldn't go together. So uh, some women came to my door one day, and this was God, I know, that sent them there, and invited me to the Christian Women's Club Bible study, and they told me it was non-denominational, and then I worried about it because I didn't want to do anything that would hurt Christian science. I prayed every time before I went. I said, God, if this is going to hurt Christian science, don't let me go. But God let me go. And after a number of months, the Bible began to open up, and I began to see the real Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross for my sins, and that I am a sinner, that we are all sinners, and that we will perish if we do not accept him for our Lord and our Savior. Is the Christian Science Church gaining or losing members? They're losing. Uh, it's very hard to come by facts because Mrs. Eddy uh, forbid anyone, any churches to give any statistics. That's in the Christian Science Manual. Uh, let me just digress a minute. May I on that manual? Then I'll go back to your question. It's important for anyone who studies the Christian Science religion to get the Christian Science Manual because Mrs. Eddy wrote it during her last years and she set the religion in concrete with that manual. So that's why they can't give out uh, statistics or change any bylaw, she wrote in there. And so to answer your question, it is diminishing. Uh, we know a little bit about it. We know that, uh, according to what we've heard, that in the fifth, since the 50s, that the practitioners, that you know, that's the people you call the pray for in Christian science, that they have declined 63%. We see the empty churches. But I urge Christians, don't give up on them and think that it doesn't matter because we know also that there are thousands of people who don't go to church who still study the religion. We know that it's influenced the laws of the land over medicine. We know that it's also getting into the movies now, like the movie Missing. You know, it's being made respectable. That's the first time I've ever seen that where Jack Lemmon played the part of a Christian scientist. It was a true story, and he had little books like these in the movie. So it is coming out more and more, their doctrine. There's another thing that people need to be aware of that Christian science has done, and that is that they've made inroads in the language by going into the most widely used dictionary, Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary, 8th edition, and presenting Mrs. Eddy's own altered definition for words. And we saw them think, what does this do, say, to a college student who's in the library and looks up the word Jesus and to find her definition? Many of these words are just ordinary words. She didn't do this for other religions. And this should be uh, made, people should be made aware of this so that they will be on guard against it and how it's affecting people's thinking. And some of these words are such as angel, atonement, baptism, Christian science, Christ, death. Devil, evil, Eucharist, first reader, God, heaven, hell, idea, so on. We found 35 of them. There could even be more. And we can't find out why Webster's Dictionary would do that with Christian science and not other religions. Mary Baker Eddy said that life is deathless, and yet she died. Can you explain? Or uh, they double think. They think in the, what they call the absolute and the relative. See, the absolute is the scientific fact in Christian science that death is only an illusion, and that what seems to die isn't there anyway, because the mortal mind claim is that matter is real. 
but she didn't really die because she's a spiritual idea of God. Now, in the relative, and this is advanced Christian science talk, which I learned in my class instruction, in the relative, she did seem to die. They can get around all of it. But what bothered me when I was coming out of it, and even while I was still in it, is why didn't one single advanced Christian science practitioner ever overcome the, quote, false claim of death if Christian science was real? And not one did. Every one of them went through that experience. Mrs. Eddy supposedly steadfastly opposed any personal devotion to herself. How is she viewed by the church today? As a prophet, teacher, what? She is considered a prophet, a teacher, and what she says goes totally. She's a very authoritarian figure, even though she's been dead since 1910, because through her writings, they can still follow everything she said and believe everything the way she told them to believe. And a devout Christian scientist, as they grow deeper into the religion, they grow closer to her, and she becomes their leader. And I don't know if you know it, but in Christian science, you are not permitted to call anyone in the church leader except Mary Baker Eddy, and they refer to her in the present tense. And this is deifying her. And I found in Matthew 23, verse 10 of the New American Standard Bible, where Jesus said, call no one leader, I'm paraphrasing here, call no one leader but the Messiah. And you can't have two leaders. And she really is their leader. Whatever she says goes, and they call her the revelator, in Christian science, the revelation, and they tell you you cannot separate the revelator from the revelation. So to know Christian science, you have to know her intimately. Do they consider themselves the one true church? Yes, they, they do. They don't just say it in those words, but they believe that you have to know Christian science. They believe they have the complete and perfect science, and that if you want to grow spiritually minded to overcome the false claims of this world, you must do it through Christian science. And they, I've even heard them say that healings outside of Christian science either won't last or aren't true because they aren't done in Christian science the proper way. Do Christian scientists believe in reincarnation? If you ask them that question, they would say flatly no, but they do in a form because see, what they believe is that when you die, the only thing that really dies is just your false belief for this matter world. And you go on spiritually living, and to what degree you had advanced before you die, after you die, you will be at that same degree. So if you haven't learned your spiritual lessons before you die, you've got to learn them later, and you go on experiencing that. So it really is a form of uh, reincarnation. Now, they don't believe you come back to this earth. Some famous people have been Christian scientists, Ginger Rogers, Doris Day, Kay Kaiser, a number of others. What is it about Christian science that appeals to these people? Well, it's a religion that appeals to their intellect. It also does away with sin. It's very much, uh, to my surprise, I'm finding out what the world wants to believe, that you yourself can do it. You know, you can get your act together by thinking right, and you can overcome things. And this is being prevalent uh, throughout our whole society. It's, it's getting in closer to what the New Age movement. And, of course, you know probably that unity and religious science and other religions, uh, they either sprung out of Christian science or they grew up about the same time and they got many of their roots from Mary Baker Eddy. Mary Baker Eddy is revered and respected by hundreds of thousands of people today. Why was she so maligned in her own lifetime? Because the people who were not devout Christian scientists dug into her life and they saw how she, uh, how she lived, what an authoritarian figure she was, how she died uh, owning three million dollars, so they claim. And of course, remember that was in 1910, which would be over 30 million today. And that she, uh, she was very hard on people who followed her. Many of her own followers turned against her because of her way of using people. Like she had an adopted son, and here he was in his 40s when she adopted him. And then when she didn't need him anymore, she uh, ditched him. That's why she did with people. She was not an easy person to live with, and she was. In her home, she had rules that was hard on people. For instance, they had to, and this is in the manual, they had to come and serve in her home as maids and if, when she called them to and serve for three years. And then she was demanding everything had to run right on schedule. And she is reported that she was uh, had the in-case meals. That is, she'd have two meals cooked for the evening in case she didn't like one. 
And by the way, I kind of like to do that myself when I go to some restaurants, but I haven't been able to afford that kind of a trick. And that whenever she would go for a drive, the maids would dust things, and if she found anything an inch away from where it originally was, that she would hit the ceiling. So one of her followers found that he could put a little marker under that object so it would be there. But she was just really hard on people and, uh, as I said, very dogmatic and unfair. No one knows for sure how many members the church has today because that information isn't given to the public. Current estimates from both inside and outside the church range from 91,000 to about 200,000. According to published reports, church membership has been declining steadily since the early 1960s. Greeting rooms and Christian Science practitioners are listed in the Pulitzer Prize-winning Christian Science Monitor, which is published monthly by the church here in Boston. Worldwide, there are about 3,000 branch churches in 57 countries and just under 4,000 officially listed practitioners, down more than 63% from the 11,000 practitioners listed during the early 1950s. Reading rooms, which are open to the public and supply approved reading materials, have decreased worldwide from 2,700 in 1978 to less than 2,500 today. The current market value of the church's liquid assets is estimated to be around $170 million. In recent years, the Christian Science Church has been plagued with dissension within and numerous lawsuits, including one from Mr. and Mrs. Douglas Swan, whose 16-month-old son Matthew died in 1977 of bacterial meningitis after being treated by Christian Science practitioners. Recently, the Swans talked to us about their difficult experience. She could tell that I was frightened and, and was uh, considering a doctor or was afraid that maybe I should go to a doctor. And so she argued us out of that and she said uh, that medicine is the superficial method of healing, that it uh, just deals with the superficial symptoms but doesn't get to the root cause of all disease, which Christian science says is mental, alienation from God, sin. So they told you definitely not to go to a doctor? Yes. Uh, that first uh, night, she said, um, medicine cannot do anything for Matthew. She said, well, I suppose they would give him a baby, baby aspirin, but you can see that that would just be superficial. How old was he? He was 15 months old. Was he cutting the teeth? No. No. He hadn't cut any teeth for months. Another thing that was going on then is that Christian science does teach that disease is the result of alienation from God and essentially from sin. And with a small child, the teachings of the church are that it's usually the parents that are I guess you would say the cause of the disease, although they wouldn't like that phrasing of it. And so, with our dear baby Matthew just burning up with fear, fever. With, with fever, I just had this terrible guilt complex to deal with, as well as the fear of, is you know, how is he doing? Is he, uh, are they able to heal him? what is going to happen to him, and thinking that it must be something that I'm doing wrong. And through the night, this just worked back and forth on my consciousness that I would continually think that it's, it's my terrible fear that he may even die from this awful fever that's causing the fever. And yet I wasn't supposed to be fearful because Christian science is going to heal it by bringing me back into tune with God. I, I do want to emphasize the press has called Christian science a catch-22, and I sure think that's a good uh, phrase for it. They just don't give you a leg to stand on. You have no rational basis for evaluating the seriousness of the illness you know, you, you, we couldn't even use a fever thermometer. Any material means to evaluate disease is against the religion. A medical diagnosis is against the religion. Any material means to relieve pain is against the religion. You couldn't even give him a cold bath 
to bring down his temperature. Christian science is opposed to more than drugs because of its Gnostic, uh, Platonic philosophy, its radical rejection of matter, you cannot use anything material to heal disease or even to relieve pain. And another thing that we discovered at the in, in this crisis that we hadn't known before, really, was that the practitioner did not want us to give a treatment for our baby. She said that Matthew would get confused if there were more than one person addressing his thoughts. Christian science treatment or prayer is not a petition to God. It's an argument addressed to the sick person. And because of this thought transference that they're trying to achieve, they didn't want any other party giving the baby a treatment at the same time they were giving him a treatment. And that was the most agonizing thing, to feel this heavy moral obligation to rely on Christian science and religion um, for our baby's healing, and yet to be told, you cannot pray for your own baby. One of the early days of, the, of that first week, the practitioner came to her home and talked to us um, about the case and talked to Matthew directly, giving him the Christian science treatment directly, and talked about the uh, ideas of false parental fears to be handled and to recognize that there was only one parent, all of which I can see were aimed at getting us to give complete control to the church and their healing representatives and tell us that we, you know, we're not really Matthew's parents, that God is the only parent and that we don't have that responsibility and we shouldn't be under that burden of a false sense of parental responsibility, which is mm -hmm. just, uh, well, it isn't Christian. What did they say would happen if you prayed for him? They said he would get confused. Hmm. They, they, um, when, when she came to the house on Monday, he, he became desperately ill on Saturday, and she finally came on Monday morning. She gave him the treatment out loud, and that was the first time we had ever heard our practitioners give treatments. Um, and here's this 15-month-old baby lying flat on a, on a couch, unable to move, and she sits there and argues with him and says, Matthew, you can't be sick. It's against the law of God. Uh, God is the only lawmaker. God is your life. Um, God is the only truth about you. You can't be sick. You don't have the right to be sick. And she also told him that there was no false parental thought that could interfere with her treatment. So these practitioners were continually telling us, get your fears out of the way. They are interfering with our work. Um, it's, it's a handicap and a hindrance to us, your, your sense of parental concern and fear. Uh, turn over control of your baby to us. What made you finally decide to go to medical authorities? Well, uh, that's, I really have to back up to explain that. Um, Matthew had this very stiff uh, spine, and very stiff back, of course, about a week into the illness. And the practitioner thought that he was paralyzed, and she was giving us lots of references to read about paralysis, what Mrs. Eddy has to say about paralysis. About the tenth night, uh, he began screaming in pain sporadically, and we could not stand it anymore. Up until that time, he had not cried out in actual pain. And we determined that we would go to a doctor at that point. Uh, we called her to dismiss her because in Christian science you have to make a choice between 
the religion and a doctor. You cannot have both. You cannot have the support of your church if you choose to go to the doctor. So we called her and told her that we had decided to go to the doctor. And she was very negative about it. She, um, I would say, harassed us and terrorized us. She told us we would have a long, hard road back to Christian science if we went to a doctor. We said that it might be a contagious disease and for the protection of the community, if for no other reason, we felt we should take our son to a doctor. If we could get Rita Swan out of the way with her negative uh, depression about um, her baby's condition, then the practitioner's metaphysical work would be effective. So uh, we called for a Christian science nurse. These nurses are called nurses, but they are trained by the church. They are not medically trained at all. And they have to stick to the same rules of Christian science that you can't use anything material to relieve pain or heal disease. What's the difference between a practitioner and a nurse? They will feed the patients and bathe them and help them get around. They also do a lot of reading to the patients and we've obtained their training course and it has several courses in oral interpretation, how to read Mary Baker Eddy's writings effectively to the patients. So they just read? They, they stay at bedsides and read or... Even to a 15 month old? Yes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Um, but bathing and feeding, that's all I can think of that they would be allowed to do. Then what happened? Well, the practitioner also, at that morning, when we expressed this concern about being obedient to the law, because Mrs. Eddy does say that Christian scientists are the most uh, law-abiding people on earth, the practitioner said that it had never occurred in her thinking to treat the idea of contagion, and she was sure it was not contagious. So she again told us, in fact, not to do what we wanted to do. Did it turn out to be contagious? It was a non-contagious form of meningitis, but a reportable form. So we were in violation of the law because of our counsel. Uh, late that same day, the terrible stiffness in Matthew's back disappeared. And it was a very mysterious, sudden disappearance. And Christian scientists are so superstitious since they don't have any information about the body. And, and uh, so the practitioner, when she heard that, she was absolutely convinced that she had healed a case of paralysis and that this was her big reward for keeping us away from the doctors. And there was just nothing you could tell her after that point that would impress her that your baby was seriously ill. She was so convinced that she had healed a case of paralysis. And the that, physicians later explained what that was, and that was when the infection had gone directly to the brain from the spine. We know now that he was screaming that night because the infection was moving from the spine to the brain. And so the practitioner was irrational about the care you needed to get for him? Well, extremely irrational. Uh, what I'm trying to point out is that no matter how ghastly or how bizarre the patient's condition is, the practitioners can always interpret it as a sign of progress. One example of that was the next day Matthew was gnashing his teeth. Having convulsions. Having convulsions and gnashing his teeth. And the practitioner said, well, don't take a negative interpretation of that. You know that could be because he's contemplating some great achievement. He he was just he was completely deranged and delirious and um, having frequent convulsions. I, I don't I didn't have medical terminology, but I think they were convulsions, gnashing his teeth wildly, and that's what she said. She said, "Why don't you take the positive interpretation of the evidence? Maybe he's gnashing his teeth because he's." planning some great achievement. What happened when you eventually took him to the doctor, or what led up to your decision? <laughs> I'm sorry. We're that right there. Yeah. Um, three days later, 
uh, she was still convinced she had healed paralysis, and we were still telling her that our baby had apparently had a nervous breakdown. He just had gone crazy. We just, we couldn't understand it. Um, he couldn't blink his eyes anymore. He couldn't swallow. He couldn't swallow. He couldn't blink his eyes. He, he was um, just in terrible condition. Wednesday of that week, the practitioner legally, legalistically weighed this thing about he can't swallow and said, well, the Mother Church does say that if the patient just can't get any nourishment at all, then they, they could get intravenous feeding. But if the food eventually goes down, then he must be swallowing it, he must be getting nourishment, so no, we couldn't, we couldn't take him to a hospital for that. And then on Thursday, um, as I told her the same old details of how deranged and delirious he was, she said, well, maybe he's broken a bone in his neck. I remember you said he fell off a bed once, and that's why he's acting so crazy. And um, she said, well, Christian scientists are allowed to go to a doctor for setting broken bones. And I think we knew that he had not broken a bone, but it was just like snapping, you know, there was something snapped inside me, and at last there was a way that I could get my baby to a doctor um, and still um, be in consonance with the rules of the church. And so we made the decision pretty quickly after she had, in a sense, given us this permission to go to a doctor. We went to the emergency room of a local hospital. I walked in with my baby um, having convulsions. Um, a doctor met me and said, how long has this child been like this, not responding to anything? And I just looked up at him and I thought, well, how could life be that simple? How could it be that simple that this child is sick, he needs care? Christian Science had made it so complicated. They had told me of all kinds of psychological problems and my fears and my false parental thoughts and maybe a fight with my dad had caused this. And how could life be that simple, I thought. Um, six nurses were surrounding Matthew within a minute. We had been waiting for a Christian science nurse to come for over three days. And immediately I thought, these are the people who care about children. Um, the, um, we finally reached the practitioner by phone from the hospital, and she was just hysterical. Her biggest concern was that the church would blame her for sending Matthew to a doctor. And she was practically shrieking at me. She said, I didn't tell you you could take him to a doctor. You could have taken him to an x-ray clinic and just had him checked for a broken bone and not told them about the fever and all this other. As if you could do that. As if there were any way under the sun that you could walk in to medically trained people with a baby in that kind of condition. Did you know the diagnosis at this point? Did you tell her over the phone? Uh, no. Uh, there were so many calls to her back and forth. Uh, I, Not she asked. Call. She asked what the diagnosis was, even though she refused to pray for the baby, and that really upset me. Uh, so because she went to see a doctor, she refused to pray for him anymore? Yes. Yes, she told us that flatly. She said, this is something you and Doug have done on your own. I take no responsibility for it. This just shows your temptation to resort to Materia Medica that I have seen all along. Uh, that was really crucial in my um, birth. Because I could see at that moment that this, no matter what they said, it wasn't Christian. You just could not refuse to pray for a dying baby and say you were a Christian. Matthew was eventually taken to a hospital, but for him, it was too late, and he died. The story you've just seen is unfortunately true. 
After hearing such a heartbreaking story, the question has to be asked, what attracts people to these Gnostic cults in the first place? The sad truth is, ironically, that most of the people involved in them are attracted initially because they have an acute interest in divine healing. Now, the real and living God does heal, but with one condition, if we ask for this miracle in accordance with his will, he hears us. He heals, but he doesn't heal on our terms, and he does not heal on demand. He heals on his terms. There are different kinds of healing in this world, both divine and demonically inspired. And the great attractiveness of Gnostic cults is that they all talk about it. The only problem is that they don't bother to differentiate between these two types of healings. Does Christian science heal? The answer is yes, sometimes. However, we must be aware that there are genuine and proven healings in all cultic systems. I have no doubt in my mind that Satan has the power to heal, and he does, but none of the glory, honor, or praise goes to Jesus Christ, nor does it go to the gospel that God has given to us in his Son. Nor are sinners brought into the kingdom because of it. It really doesn't make any sense to go to the kingdom of the cults for healing when we can have that healing power of the real Jesus Christ in our lives by faith. Christ does the best job of all, and it doesn't cost anything. The price has already been paid. Why should anyone go to Mary Baker Eddy or to the Fillmore's? She took morphine during the latter part of her life for terrible pain, and she died of bronchial pneumonia and did not rise from the dead as her followers expected her to. It's obvious that her theories didn't work for her. What a nightmare it would be to have followed the ethics and morality of Jesus and never to have known him or believed in the cleansing power of his sacrifice on the cross. What a horror to meet him at the throne of judgment someday and have him say, Depart from me, I never knew you, workers of iniquity. Statistics indicate that the membership of the Christian science cult has declined somewhat in recent years, and numerous lawsuits have been filed on behalf of people who have died as a consequence of ignoring medical treatment in favor of the prayer treatments of Christian science practitioners and others in the mind science cults. The historical impact of this cult and Mrs. Eddy's teachings cannot be discounted or overlooked by the Christian community today. As you have seen, this is such a rich and powerful cult which has the power to essentially determine life or death of Christian science members and their children cannot be ignored. May God give us the grace and discernment to know the truth and do something with it. Gnostics and all of the mind science and healing cults need to be reached with the glorious gospel of the real Jesus Christ, not the one manufactured by Mary Baker Eddy. Thank you for watching. Goodbye, and may the Lord richly bless you. Sleep. The dream turns into a nightmare. Now here's your host, Dr. Walter Barton.